Welcome to Effective Animal Advocacy Show on All About Animals Radio. I am your host, Billy Groom. Today, my guest is Dr. Mark Abraham. He was a veterinarian. He still currently is, but not practicing, so I just found out. Uh, in the UK, his impact and his day-to-day -day impact is in animal welfare. And that has what earned him a spot on this show. Actually, I'm kidding. I'm honored. The honor is all mine. Mark's impact spans widely from being the backbone behind legal changes, which we'll talk about, Lucy's Law, creative initiatives, providing education and inspiration. And we're going to talk about all this. Plus, he's an award winner. So we're going to talk about that as well. So welcome, Mark. Hello, Billy. Thank you so much for joining us. This is awesome. I'm guessing um, your surname has been referenced in, in, with regard to doing dog related podcasts, right? I know. And the thing is, I mean, look at my hair for those people who can see I, I can't even groom my own hair. Never mind groom a dog. No, I'm all about the brain and behavior. So it gets a little I'm going to have to marry some guy with the last name train, I think is what I'm going to have to do. Nice. <laughs> that my game plan. <laughs> So let's talk about, I guess we're kind of all, well, I'm sure it started before Lucy's Law, but that, uh, you know, obviously is uh, a huge impact that you made with Lucy's Law. Can you run us through that? Lucy's Law, thank you, by the way. Um, Lucy's Law is a ban on third party commercial puppy and kitten dealers. So pet stores, for example sell puppies and kittens or anyone that sells them remotely without the mum and it was a campaign that was sort of inspired uh to start with with, with when i was a practicing veterinarian seeing puppies coming in with parvovirus from a third party dealer into my clinic but being unable to contact the actual breeder so there was no accountability and i kind of went undercover and and um where these puppies were being bought and uh, it was unbelievable and, and, and the whole world opened up and at the time the government was always recommending anyone buying a puppy to see him or her interacting with their mum yet the same government was giving licenses out to third party dealers to sell legally without the mum so it was hypocrisy at the top but I didn't know about campaigning back then and I I did know about uh, dog shows and fun dog shows because I was a TV veterinarian at the time. And I was doing some daytime TV shows. So I was getting invited to a lot of fun dog shows for charities to judge and realised how popular these dog shows were and how crazy the British public are for dogs and rosettes in any weather. So I uh, so I started um, my own dog show called Pup Aid um, as a sort of nod to live aid. And we had celebrities judging dogs and the, and the awareness was really about puppy mills, puppy farming, about the importance of seeing puppies interacting with their mum, the importance of rescue pet adoption. Um, yeah. And then in the, we'd have food and we'd have trade stalls and we'd have live music. And then in the middle of the day, we'd have the parade of rescued ex-breeding dogs from puppy farms, puppy mills. And that was the sort of presenting of the evidence and everyone just stopped and started crying. So it was an awareness raiser about the, co the the correct ways to to get a dog. So rescue, obviously, first if possible, where there are also puppies that people don't often uh, realise. Uh, or if you're going to get a puppy, then see it him or her interacting with with their mum. So that was kind of the start. Those few years of of celebrity judge dog shows and Ricky Gervais came and Brian May and some incredible names started in Brighton where I live I moved it to London so more celebrities could could access it and then I started going to Westminster and Parliament and learning about parliamentary campaigning e-petitions debates meeting MPs all these things all these tools that were completely alien to me and then 10 years off pretty much to the day 10 years after I saw those first puppies dying of parvovirus coming from puppy mills at the time the puppy farms they that were coming from uh, were Wales. Um, we changed the law, and so now it's illegal to buy a puppy or a kitten in the in the well. It was England. It's also Wales, Scotland, and almost Northern Ireland. So pretty much the whole UK now. Um, <clears throat> it's illegal to buy a puppy or a kitten unless you see him or her interacting with their mum. 
in the place that they wow. were born. So you have accountability. Now, the instant pushback, what about if it's a fake mum? What about if there's no mum? What about if it's a different dog pretending to be a mum? Doesn't matter. Everyone's accountable. But if you're the seller, you're the breeder. Any problems, there's someone who sold you that puppy who is accountable. So it's the first first step, really, in ending cruelty because the mums have to be visible. And as you know, with puppy farms, puppy mills, puppy factories, wherever you call them, wherever you are in the world, they are successful because no one ever sees the mum because the puppies are sold remotely. And if they saw the mum, they probably wouldn't buy from there or and or they would flag the conditions for being horrific. So, so it was always the first step. Um, and Lucy was a, I've got the rosette, the official rosette here. Lucy was a Cavalier oh. King Charles Spaniel, amazing yeah. dog, hilarious dog. Um, <laughs> and she was so much fun to be around. She was from a puppy farm, from puppy mill, rescued at about five, had so many health problems, separation anxiety, had arthritis, epilepsy, all the quite classic signs you get from puppy farms. Um, she lived another three years. And in those three years, her owner, uh, her best friend, let's say, Lisa, rehabilitated her, um, made calendars with her. Uh, every day there was Facebook posts, raise awareness about puppy farming, raise awareness about rescue. And she became kind of the face of, of puppy farming. And then um, when she sadly passed away in 2016 on December the 8th, um, it was a, quite a peak activity of campaigning. And we were we were facing so many brick walls with campaigning from the government, from the pet industry, alarmingly from some of the biggest animal welfare uh, organisations in the country. So we had we had to do a rebrand. And that was the thing, I think, that that really saved the campaign. We changed the campaign to ban commercial third party puppy and kitten dealers and sellers to Lucy's Law. And Lucy had a backstory. She had a very cute face. She was so much, as I say, so much fun to be around. And and the campaign went stratospheric overnight. Um, okay. Ricky Gervais carried on supporting. And yeah, by personalizing it, giving it a backstory, yeah. pink was her favorite color. Um, we became yeah. uh, the Daily Mirror, quite a famous newspaper in the UK, became our media partner. Um, we did another petition. We did all sorts of things and, and we got it over the line. So Lucy kind of led the campaign, really. And we all sort of filed in behind us, about five or six of us campaigners. Yeah. And we just we combined our skill works. sets and we yeah. and we overcame the government, the, the pet industry and four of the biggest charities in the UK who were trying to block us. So yeah, or well, let's That's say amazing. refusing to support us. Yeah, be diplomatic. Yeah. But yeah, so yeah, we got accountability. That brings up so many. There's just so many things that went through my head on that story. For one, it took well, ten awesome years. Story. It took ten years it to change does. the first law. Takes, change takes time, and you brought up a change couple takes time exactly. And it requires people to to hop on board, and also what you just said the barriers to overcome those barriers and challenges because there's people that in organizations that you think would support it would want it they you know based on their website or what their mission statement is and their and they just don't and that's usually for human ego and human reasons and i deal with that all the time so there's these barriers that people do not think are there and challenges. And what I found really interesting about what you said is you were basically on a, a learn as you go system there with mm -hmm. a lot of what you were dealing with. And people seem to think that there's this answer for everything and that we all know and we don't. We're all on a, a learn as we go. Oh my God. Um, and even and not yourself, only that. who's, uh, you know, highly recognized in the industry, and you're still on a learn as you go. 100%. And imposter syndrome, which I, didn't even know it was a thing but it, re That's it really is and you're sitting in you know Westminster in Parliament I mean I I was being I was a full-time veterinarian at the time and I had a day off every Tuesday and I used to go to Westminster every Tuesday for years so I went there to the Parliament which is an hour away at least because I live in Brighton um probably about 300 times in six years lobbying going to receptions learning the whole culture of parliamentary campaigning and you know, to the point where, I mean, we passed Lucy's Law in, in England, Scotland, Wales, almost Northern Ireland. And then um, 
Boris Johnson and Carrie, his wife now, yeah. they were getting a dog. Um, and I helped source the dog for them. So they got um, a puppy, which was from uh, a rescue that only really deals with called Friends of Animals Wales. They only deal with puppies with problems that are going to be drowned or ex-breeding dogs that are going to be shot. So I had a chat with them, with Carrie, actually. And um, she didn't need, need much convincing because she's a huge rescue dog advocate. Um, but yeah, now Dylan is a, a Jack Russell cross puppy. Um, and he lived at number 10. So well, technically number 11 next door. So it was a, it was amazing to be so involved and ingrained in that culture in Westminster that I could actually source a rescue dog for the prime minister. And uh, we did the handover and he ran around the garden, little Dylan and Boris put a Lucy's Law rosette on. Yeah. Uh, and it was that... amazing to, for the prime minister to be wearing your grassroots campaign rosette with little Lucy's face was quite overwhelming. Yeah. yeah, I bet that. And it just helped so much with spreading awareness and to show that these yeah. dogs can live, they can move right in and, and live anywhere. And it's just a matter of getting the education and, and going ahead and doing it. The other part that came up it, that <clears throat> in my mind is it's it's one thing to enact these laws and another thing to enforce them. Are you yeah. finding it's enforced? Yeah, because the, the, the public enforce it. It's called Isn't policing awesome? by consent. That's what I was going to say. The public probably The public says, enforce it. You know, that's and, and um, what I love seeing on responsible breeder websites, for example, is, you know, we support Lucy's Law and you can see the mum and um, people know what to look for and they, they know if there's a problem. Uh, well, one thing that I think you'll get as a as a fellow campaigner is um, when you get trolls going, there's still people selling without the mum or there's still people. And you think, yeah, if all laws came in and everyone just behaved themselves immediately, you probably wouldn't need policemen, speed cameras, court cases. Now there's a actual a, a, um, a legal framework where you can investigate and prosecute. But people are so quick, aren't they, to go, oh, told you so. And I, my answer to that is, A, I'm pretty sure murder is illegal, but it still happens. So maybe you're going after the wrong people. Um, and B, just, yeah, just because a law comes in doesn't mean everyone suddenly goes, oh, I, I've got to behave myself now. So it's you still get that pushback even after you've achieved some progress. But you know. it does give it a platform. It gives it stability. And for the people who do complain, go and complain to the people that aren't following it, not the ones that are enacting it. Do you know what I mean? It's mad. It's <laughs> absolutely, some of the stuff of I've received over the last few years. Oh, and wow. What they're saying is, genuinely, let's have no laws because what's the point? Well, uh, all right, that's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I mean? So yeah, it's been it's been interesting on so many different levels. But yeah, you know, and also you know, Lucy's laws raised awareness, changed behaviour. Um, so it's it's yeah, you know, and of course it's banned puppies and kittens from pet pet stores. Yes, so we could use that here. Absolutely. Yeah. So there you go. I, I that's Lucy's great. law. It's, yeah, we need to expand. There's still that. work. There's still work that needs to be done. No one's denying that, but it's definitely. <laughs> <clears throat> the first step was always making the breeders accountable. Yes, absolutely. Good one. Okay, so that change that goes on to, well, we got in a little bit on the topic there on collaboration, which one of your big campaigns for collaboration was Pause to Connect. Well, we actually launched it yesterday. So this is fresh. Um, woof, woof. We got the I goods. Aware... We got the goods. Woo. Right. I was aware that the local shelter, the local RSP was pretty much flowing. You have the, the issues anyway, but you also have issues now with the pandemic and um, um, puppies that weren't socialised because of social distancing. You have the puppies and dogs now that have separation anxiety. I'm sure it's the same all around the world. Yeah. So you have yes. dogs that are more <clears throat> sticky, more harder to rehome because they potentially need more rehabilitation, need more time need more uh, work with behaviorists 
So I was conscious of that and also the fact that loneliness is a huge issue, again, all around the world. I think social media doesn't help. Uh, I think the pandemic didn't help. And obviously, pets offer unconditional love um, and company. So I, we have a loneliness charity here in Brighton called Together Co. We have the RSPCA shelter in Brighton. So I kind of married them together. And we now have a Cause to Connect campaign where we're encouraging fostering and adoption to help treat human loneliness. Um, it's Beautiful. a no-brainer. It's an absolute it's no-brainer. It's a no-brainer, yeah. So, so we launched it yesterday with the help of uh, Peter Egan, the actor, and Gail Porter, who's a, a mental health advocate. Both have rescue animals. Um, and it was very successful. Weather wasn't great, but it didn't matter. It was, it was bigger than that. So we're looking then to roll out this sort of concept across the country. And it was just a wonderful... I mean, I'm a big fan of collaboration. I'm sure you are too. For grassroots campaigners, it's kind of essential to pool yeah, resources okay. with like-minded individuals, organisations. Um, so it was lovely to before because they why would they to now be working together to help rehome animals temporary permanent um, or and deal with loneliness and mental health. So yeah, it's 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 just lovely to facilitate these things. And, I, and my role, I think nowadays seems to be more facilitating got lots of contacts i know incredible people organizations campaigners and i find myself a lot now going right you need to talk to them you know email intro you know well it's, uh, play, it's in, play nice that, that is really <laughs> impressive when people have that ability based on well i mean you're you're a celebrity veterinarian you're a celebrity animal advocate so when you have that ability to connect people. I mean, everybody has to know what they believe in and, and be able to do it themselves and get to that that spot. And we're going to talk about that later, actually, in a, in a little, well, coming right up, actually, we're going to talk about how people can do that and how they can step up because yes, there's people like yourself that can, that can really help people with what they've got going on. But on the same note that they need to know how to get that going on. We've talked about how some of this can take a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of learning process as you go through. But once you've got something going on, those collaborations are, are so appreciative. But let's take a step back and talk about how people would actually just even start on this. And I, I want to tap into your book, Be More Mosquito, which I just... Uh, I think it's just so it great because it gives people a real insight into what they can do, what's the realities of it without being so structured. It It's flexible and allows people to get their head around what they can do and become creative and imaginative and innovative. So tell me about, tell us about your book. So thank you. Um, it's it's a book that I, I had to write because I learned so much in the 10 years of campaigning that I just wanted to share what I'd learned as someone who didn't really know what they were doing um, and kind of learned the hard way through experience. And um, yeah, it was important for me to get it down on paper so people could sort of pick it up and, and do stuff as well. It's called Be More Mosquito because of the Dalai Lama phrase, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. <laughs> so Be More Mosquito, and I think it's a hashtag title. I'm not sure how many hashtag titles there are, so it's a bit different. Again, a bit, you know, using imagination and, and thinking a bit outside the box, which is essential for grassroots campaigning and to get noticed, obviously, as you know. So, yeah, I, I, every chapter is a tool that's out there that's free, that's accessible to everyone, that you can make a difference and you can either um, r raise awareness about an issue, you can either change public behaviour or you can influence legislation or in the case of Lucy's Law, all three. Um, but it's kind of a anything's possible when there's no excuse kind of book. And I hope it inspires people to to actually go, oh, I care enough about something to do to act. And it's that it's that that's crucial to starting your own campaign, 
joining a pre-existing one, finding people to maybe have that conversation and start one as a, as a collaboration. Um, but all the tools are in there to do something. Even if it's retweeting something while you're sitting on the toilet, you're, you're doing exactly. something. Yeah. And, um, and there's so much blame culture in the world and people moaning and it's this one's fault, it's that one's fault, or someone will fix it. They won't. So just get on with it and turn the moaning into productive campaigning. Yeah, and you never you'll know find where people, it's going to lead. You never know where it's going to lead. I didn't know we were end, going to end up changing the law. I, was, I started off just raising awareness about yeah. rescue dogs and, and responsible breeding. And all of a sudden, 10, now 13, 14 years later, changed like five laws. And I run the all-party parliamentary group in Westminster for dog welfare. I influence or help influence lots of other laws or at least um, help people know what to do and, and point them in the right direction. Facilitate again. So, yeah, it's it changed my life. I mean, that one night on duty with the puppies coming in and dying of parvo changed my whole life. Uh, I was quite happy being a veterinarian <laughs> um, and thought I always would be. I, I kind of still am, as you say, but I'm not practising. Hopefully I'll go back to it. But at the moment... I'm really enjoying helping others, facilitating other campaigns, um, and just and we just running this group that. in Westminster because the the Westminster group is a sort of a hub of. So, for example, okay, I get a few emails in saying, you know, the rescue sector is in a, a, a real mess at the moment. You've got the energy bill crisis. You've got dogs almost overwhelming shelters because there's so many coming in. Um, and yet there was no sort of government help during the pandemic. What are we going to do? So I go, right, we're going to book a room in Westminster. We're going to have seven CEOs from rescues across the UK. And we're going to have, they're going to give 10 minute presentations each. And we're going to have an hour or two of discussion. So that's happening on the 21st of February. And so we've got the biggest room in Westminster, in the Palace of Westminster, 170 people. It's already full. And we've got the CEOs and we're going to have a chat and to be in a position where I can make that happen. And again, I'm facilitating. I'll introduce the speakers. I'll MP, but everyone else will kind of do the work because I'm just providing that platform. And I love that because it's so simple and these conversations are essential and progress will be made on that night, hundred percent. And even, even to the point where, in the daytime, 3 to 5 p.m., we've got an MP drop-in session. So MPs are coming to get their picture taken with a dog and maybe hold something up saying, consider your local rescue shelter and animals. Um, and it's all progress because it's all keeping the conversation going, which, as you know, is essential with campaigning. Because if you stop talking about stuff, people think it's either fixed or it doesn't matter anymore. So you have so to true. keep that narrative that needs... going. Yeah. And, and I like the idea of bringing different people with different skill sets, experiences, the way they learned what they know, how they know it all together, because having like-minded people is different than having like missioned people. So everybody could have the same mission and goal, but they're a little bit different in their mindset simply because of their experiences, their knowledge, how they know what they know. But once you start combining all of those, with some open minds, all of a sudden you get all these solutions, whether they're on a, a smaller scale or on a larger scale. But in order for any progress to be made, you need multiple solutions coming together and working together for that to happen. It, it can't be one person doing one thing with one way of doing it. No. So all meeting in a room, that is, that's fantastic. I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes out of that. How fortunate yeah. that's when I would like to be that mosquito or that fly on that one or part of that. that is, and sadly, awesome. sadly, we can't film it because of parliamentary uh, right. rules are so strict. Yeah. But <clears throat> I we just, will see the outcome. it's just important for, for people to have a place where they can have these discussions, not be judged. It's all very polite. Um yes. And it's amazing because, you know, when I think back to not having any parliamentary experience or, even, you know, we had a show when I was growing up in the UK called Spitting Image. I don't know if you've heard of it. So it's kind of a satirical puppet show where the puppets are famous people, politicians, etc. And everyone watched it. Everyone watched it. It was so, so popular. And that was in the 80s, right? 
Okay. So that was my only real uh, experience with politics. Obviously, it's on the news as well. But being a nerdy, sciencey, sciencey biology, chemistry, physics guy, mm. politics, history, law, it, all that was someone else did that. <laughs> and now to be so involved in it and to be less, maybe sort of directing the traffic a little bit uh, in a good way. It's yeah. it's a huge privilege. So yeah, it's, it's brilliant. Yeah, I love it. And, and it's all for dogs. And, yeah, keep challenging and keep learning. Your that's that's. So, you were somewhere. I don't even know where. I guess I should have researched this. Uh, you were doing a documentary or starting a documentary. Is that yeah? I was approached, Can... approached just before lockdown. Um, Company who kind of wanted to be me to be a co contributor uh, about sort of unscrupulous, irresponsible breeding and and um, dog welfare. Okay. But I looked at the treatment, which, as you know, is is the sort of synopsis of the show, and it was okay. pretty good. But there was a few little mistakes, and there was a presenter written in, and I went back to them and I said, "Look, with respect, which is." as you know, one of the key phrases when you're campaigning, <laughs> um, with respect, <laughs> which can translate as so many different things, um, with respect, uh, the treatment's good, but it could be better, i.e. this documentary could be actually a, 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 a platform for changing more stuff. And also there's a presenter and I'm kind of going to have to educate the presenter. So why don't uh -huh. I just present it? Anyway, they there came down to Brighton and we had a chat and decided that, yes, I can be the presenter and be, I could have the sort of ed uh, editorial control, whatever you call it, so yeah. I can pick who I want in it. So we we did about, uh, before Christmas, we probably did about 10 to 15 interviews in the UK. So, again, parliamentarians, campaigners, charities, dog welfare people. And then we went to the States, um, which I only came back from last week. And we mainly to, to, to cover what's called Victoria's Law. And Victoria's Law is a campaign in Pennsylvania to ban the sale of puppies, kittens and rabbits in Pennsylvanian pet stores. So similar to Lucy's Law. Um, it's a campaign that's been going a few years, named after Victoria, who was a German shepherd rescued from a puppy mill, again with problems that would be, would have been passed on to all her litters. Um, and it needs a little bit of help getting over the line. We're almost there. There's a phenomenal campaign. It's run by uh, Grace and Steve. Grace runs Finding Shelter. So she goes around the puppy mills, um, having dogs handed over to her puppies, but usually ex-breeding dogs. She then rehabilitates and fosters and potentially um, either sort of passes on to other shelters or has them herself. Um, so, yeah, we, we wanted to shine a light on that. So we came to the States and went to D.C., went to Maryland, went to Philadelphia, because Maryland, they've done it. They've got the state ban. Um, Pennsylvania, obviously, they haven't. So we went around the Amish puppy mills. Um a phenomenal trip. I think we did nine interviews in total. So three senators, again, campaigners, a vet, a behaviorist, uh, and John Goodwin, who's the, the director of the campaign director for Humane Society US. Okay. Um, Grace, obviously, my friend Grace, who's yeah. coordinates it all. We did like a three and a half hour interview. Don't worry, it won't all be in the documentary. Um, <laughs> so again, it's these sort of leading voices in yeah. the sector hate the word industry, in the sector that are all working together and collaborating and just doing amazing things. I mean, to, 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 to sit opposite a Republican senator in the Harrisburg State Capitol building and talk about dog welfare, and she, Senator Pe Tracy Pennycook, she's got two rescue dogs. You know, oh, everywhere you look, there's, there's rescue dog advocates. You know, the state rep for Pennsylvania, for Allentown, Pennsylvania, in Allentown, um, Jeannie McNeil, she's got two rescue dogs. So it's go. it's everyone that we spoke to was kind of on the same level. We did a bit of undercover stuff. I won't give too many spoilers away. But it was it's it's basically about dog welfare. So it's about the rise in canine fertility clinics in the UK. It's about the legal and illegal trade at international puppies, which is legislation that's 
um, stalled at the moment, but it's it will happen at some point. And Victoria's law, so it's 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 encompasses quite a few issues which need changing, but it's also got loads of campaigning tips in there as well. So we're asking legislators, it's a word I have struggled with the whole time in the US, legislators, um, how to, what's the best way for people to approach them? Right. You know, and as you well know, sort of the tone of campaigning is yeah. probably the most important thing to get right. How you talk to people, how you approach people. Don't go all angry and blaming people. Just you have to be, it has to be a very kind, compassionate dialogue because that's when you that's engage people. That is, that's very so, interesting. Yeah. It gets back to anything in business, really. If you want someone to, to listen to you, for one, there has to be something in it for them. They have mm -hmm. to see the value and they have to want to work with you. They have to want to work with you. Exactly. It's so Absolutely. important. And do you know what? I've, I've seen so many examples of that anger, even on Twitter. Why haven't you done this? Why haven't you done that? And it's like, how are you expecting that person to react when they see that? They're going to, that's it. The drawbridge is just going to be up. Even to the point where, and I write this, I write about this in the book, the language of campaigning, the tone is one thing, but even the, the, the minutiae of the language. So if you say to someone, I was disappointed in your response, you can forget any more interaction. If you say, I'm, I was surprised at your response, it's always open still. It means the same thing. But it's it's those differences. And, and also, I also write, you know, we, we have here the BBC Parliament channel. So it's always on. Select committees, what's going on in the chamber, debates, have it on in the background. The language of political campaigning, especially, is so fascinating when when you get it right and you are contacting legislators parliamentarians <laughs> mps we'll bleep um, that word out <laughs> yeah you're speaking their language yeah. and, you, and i always think you're you're already making progress because you're showing respect to their world yeah. um, and that's something that so, yeah. is learned and it could be learned even in different areas it could be learned in your own business that yeah. somebody does separately. Just be nice. Yeah, those skills, <laughs> exactly. Just, just so think simple. about what the other person is hearing and, and how you're portraying it. So speaking of tips, well, that's obviously a great one. Maybe we'll talk about a few tips for campaigning. I Just before we go, and but just, just before we go, I do want to talk about the special award that you got, but Let's let's stick on this uh, tips for campaigning sure. for a second well, here. Dave. Let's throw a few more at us here. I don't want people to not buy the book, obviously, because that's why we're <laughs> on there. No, no, I'm joking. Um, the tone that we've no, discussed no, is, the is the tone is important. You've mentioned probably uh, one of the top tips as well: the solutions. Provide solutions. Make it as easy as possible for those lawmakers, law changers, to go. That's a great idea. Let's see if that's possible. If you can make, if you can see if it's possible yourself, and have a pro bono uh, lawyer, attorney check stuff over. There's no point campaigning for something that, at the end of the day, can't be achieved. Um, so have have a solution. Um, the tone. Have a team. You're never going to do this on your own. Never going to do this on your own. Mm. Um, we had a fantastic team. Uh, Julia, who was sort of the minutiae of the legislation she was absolute expert in it we had mm. linda who did similar things to me in terms of sort of the the imagination the creativity that sort of element we had sue who was very much um the data the business mm. side of stuff mm. we had sarah clover who was the barrister so she was the attorney that was overseeing the legislation changes uh, philippa sadly passed away during the campaign of cancer and she was also the sort of the business end but n uh, never did our skill sets overlap. Mm, it, mm -hmm. it, we tessellated unbelievably. 50, 60, 70 emails a day for years, backwards and forwards, reports, parliamentary stuff. I mean, I was going into parliament with all kind of them, their work in my bag and, and, and being presented. And I obviously couldn't That's have done it without any of them. And then I love the fact that, you know, Lucy led the campaign. And as I say, we all filed behind her. And 
she got us all over the line. But it's important to realise that a not every not one person can do this on their own. But B, if you don't think other people are thinking the same, go onto Twitter, go onto Instagram, use hashtags, find like-minded individuals, and you will you will create some sort of team. It could be international, it could be local. It's also useful for mental health because if you are working with people, I say working, you're not getting paid, but if you're campaigning with people who get it. It's really important for your mental health to yes. not feel that you're alone because campaigning can be a very lonely activity. Yes. Um, another tool I think that's essential is imagination, creativity. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get noticed in a world now where 24 seven, there's just information coming from everywhere. So publicity stunts, stuff that you think, should I should do it, just do it. Because if you grab headlines and you, you make an impact, um, all the resulting PR you get from it, you can use as content. And as grassroots yeah. campaigners, that's all you've got <clears throat> in terms of raising awareness. So um, imagination hashtags in this day and age are so important. And downtime, talk about mental health, but you, 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 you are in danger of campaign fatigue, of burning out. You're useless if, if that happens. So you have to balance it out with exercise, swimming, walking, just something that it has nothing to do with what you're doing. And weirdly, I find this anyway, that's when the the, the ideas come in because your Absolutely. brain is switched off. Yeah. Yep. That's so, when um, you can get back to it and, and be a fresh and clear brain. Yeah, Especially and be prepared for the long, the long haul. Yeah. Do you know, do you yeah, remember when that... you're young and, and you're up late doing your homework and your mum says, or dad, or anyone, your guardian, can't say anything anymore. Um, <laughs> um, and, you, and they go, you know, go to sleep and maybe wake up early so you're fresh. And you go, no, 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 I don't want to do it now. But it's so true. If you just yeah. stop, get up early the next day and you, you're much fresher and you'll be much more successful because you need downtime to recover. Because campaigning, great and I say this a lot to people, Campaigning is not nine to five and then you turn your computer off and that's it. Campaign is 24 seven. You're constantly thinking about it all the time. Yes. All um, the time. So you do need to switch off and actually almost bully yourself into yeah. actually taking some time out because it's very easy to get carried away and just keep on doing it. Um, yeah, yeah. That would be my tip. I, yeah, and I need to, <laughs> to take on some of those tips because it can just be just overwhelming it also, I think, is because it is often different every day and you're meeting new people and you're doing different things and it becomes addicted because, yes, there's challenges, but if you're the kind of person that loves to come up with creative and innovative ways to overcome these challenges, then it just, it becomes addictive, even though you might not be achieving everything that you want to that day something different happened and you met somebody great or yeah. you know everything so it happens just becomes, for a reason every interaction yeah. has, absolutely does i mean I, I i remember coming away from westminster many many times thinking what was the point of that why yeah. did why did i even bother and then three years later that's why it happened and, and right. i guess that's that's kind of being optimistic at the same time and but it's true you don't some you, you, what you're campaigning for is often common sense but sometimes when you don't get the support or maybe it's a delayed support or maybe someone just point blank refuses to support you, which we had, there's reasons for it. And yes. you've almost got to unpick and work backwards. With, and then, as I say, there's so many conversations going on behind the scenes that you're not aware of. Um, yeah. It's only a matter of time. That's, oh, that's why that didn't happen. That's why that MP didn't support me there. Exactly. But my dad, my dad, bless him, he passed away seven years ago but he was an advertiser so I grew up he was a creative in advertising and I'm pretty sure that transferred over to me by osmosis somehow yeah. in those years I mean he came up with brands and fonts and logos and and incredibly successful campaigns just by being creative yeah. and so I kind of had a head start sadly I never had the conversation with him that was like we kind of do similar things Obviously, advertising is getting as many people as possible to purchase something, and campaigning is getting as many people as possible. 
people to change Stop their behavior or contact their legislator. So it's they're so similar the two the two journeys and it's it's funny how um yeah we never had a chance to discuss it which always makes me sad but he's he's probably he's one of my biggest inspirations my second inspiration is my grandma who escaped on the kinder transport from the holocaust and wow. she she taught me that anything's possible and to never give up so i had this perfect campaigning uh dna wow. if you like of yes of, survival and campaigning and using creativity to to make a difference she was too old to go on the kinder transport she was a year too old she was 17 told she couldn't go as had she had to follow her parents to auschwitz ducked under the barriers at the train station went to a fancy dress shop came back wearing a nurse's uniform and pretended to be a red cross nurse helping the children escape so that's how she got out so again wow. Quick, quick thinking, creativity. Quick thinking, yeah. And then if, use your resources. Say, and right there, use your resources. She had use a dress shop there. So it's how can what I have right in front of me right now be of value to me? So and, and I love it's... that about uh, years later, things come back because you hear that, you know, oh, things happen for a reason, which is really annoying at the moment when you it's have this so closed doom. door yeah. slammed on your face. It's like, no, I'm not seeing that right now. But I have learned a lot from that as well, just why people ask certain questions or why people would have a mindset that they have or why they would uh, turn something away. And then it it takes takes you down this path of researching more and learning more and understanding how other people feel about something or what their personal goal or investment would cause them to think. And then you're more prepared for the next time somebody has that same mindset or ask those same questions that maybe ready. Yeah. we weren't ready to answer at the time. Exactly. Yeah, those the other are thing, great tips. The other thing, Billy, I think is it's worth mentioning is if you are trying to persuade people to do something, which campaigning kind of is, <laughs> to set yeah. up a, we call it, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out. Yeah. If you create something that's so hot in terms of popular and buzzy and oh my God, look what's happening over there. And you and you have Ricky Gervais supporting it. And you have cross-party, I think you call it bipartisan in the States, and the um, cross-party support. And you have the press going and the media going crazy for it. You're going to pull people in that probably wouldn't want to be involved to start with because no one wants to be missing out on this stuff. And I think that is so important, again, as a tip, to make something to make your campaign so hot and fear of missing out that people can't not take an interest or come to support and and again when they do come knocking be as inclusive and super polite as possible especially if they didn't support you to start with come on in this is a yes. team effort lucy's yes, leading I, I... it and we're all right behind her you know yeah absolutely i've worded that people People like to hop on board a moving train is it's sort of, you know, what you're saying. And that yeah, I've like always that. worded yeah. that is not everybody wants to start that train. Not everybody wants to get on board the train when it's not moving. But once it's moving. Yeah, lots of people like to. And the idea is to welcome all that because that's where that that train. hundred percent. Everyone's going. welcome. Everyone's welcome. Bring your good vibes. Let's get this over the line. And I think, you know, this is in the book as well, but it's almost, so I call it the ambush. You get the media on board, you get the politicians on board, the celebrities on board, the charities, the stakeholders, everyone's on board. At the end of the day, the minister, who is often influenced by public pop popularity of a campaign, you don't give them anywhere to go because everyone's supporting it. And I think that's definitely what happened with Lucy's Law. We we just literally surrounded the, the chief decision maker, the minister, with positivity. Yeah. So he, he couldn't really say no. Yeah, but that, that's, like that's what in. took the 10 yeah. years. <laughs> you just overcome all the barriers. That's fantastic. So we will have the links to the book in oh, the cool. show notes. Thank you. So please, yeah, please grab that book and, and be inspired by it. I think that's what it really all comes down to is, uh, you know, when you're reading it, think for how you can really incorporate it into what's important to you. 
and what you can do. And on a closing, I'm going to screen share here. I don't know if this, most people might be only listening to this as a podcast, but I'm going to screen share this picture, which was, is you receiving an award. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is still like crazy for me. That I'll never get used to the fact that I got this award, especially from the king. That's phenomenal. So tell us about that. <laughs> um, okay, so we have a system in the uh, award system in the UK called the Honours. Um, traditionally, until Her Majesty the Queen sadly passed away, um, they were lists were announced on her birthday in June and at New Year. So you had the New Year's honours and the Queen's birthday honours. And there's there's different types of awards. So the main ones, there's the MBE, the OBE and the CBE, and there's knighthoods as well. So they are reward, awards for doing good stuff. The OBE is usually <laughs> for campaigners who have done good stuff. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the Queen, the Queen chose me in her 2021 birthday honours list. And she wow, was too ill totally. to 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 give it, and then there was a delay with COVID. Everything was sort of delayed, as you know. And last March two thousand twenty-two, I went to Windsor Castle, took my mum, and um, I received my OBE, which is a medal um, for services to animal welfare. And the, oh, and congratulations. the it was Prince that Charles is... then. Thank you. And now he's obviously King Charles. So the Queen uh, Queen announced me on her list, and the King awarded it. So it's actually quite a good combination. Um, obviously, I would have preferred the the Queen. No disrespect to Charles, um, but interestingly, interestingly, when you approach his His Majesty now the King, um, you're briefed and you're told about the protocol, and they they they've also been given information that they can start the conversation. So I approached the King as he is now. And he, he speaks exactly as you hear him on the news. And um, he said, oh, terrible. And after Christmas, uh, puppies get abandoned into rescue. And I said, I said, I said, with all due respect, um, Your Majesty, I don't want to talk about pets right now. I want to talk about the fact that Lucy's Law was inspired by my grandma. Now, Prince Charles, as he was back then, had a real soft spot, still has a real soft spot for the kinder transport survivors. And my grandma had met him numerous times at lunches in Windsor Castle and different in different mm. places. So and she always had a really good banter with him. She didn't care what she said. So the last meeting she said she asked him, uh, uh excuse me, Prince Charles, uh, but do you use Botox? You always look so young. And he's, oh, no, I don't use Botox. So they always had this little this little dialogue together. Sure, yeah. Anyway, she she's she died sadly. Uh, grandma died, passed away in um about 18 months ago. Um, well, actually nearly two years ago. Um, so she didn't know about the OBE, but she kind of always hoped uh -huh. I'd get one. Um oh, because she's she, she and um so I said to her, like with all due respect, um, Your Majesty, I just want to say Lucy's Law was inspired by my grandma. You met her many times. Every time you met her, she was so happy to meet you. She couldn't wait to meet you, and we always had the stories of all your, your banter afterwards. And uh, she sadly passed away, and I just want to use this opportunity to thank you so much for making her happy every time. Uh, she just loved meeting you, and it kind of it kind of joined the dots for me to be in that situation and be able to thank him. And my mum, who could hear the conversation, it was her mum I was talking about, was just crying her eyes out. I'm sure. Um, and it just felt so wholesome to leave, uh, you know, and then you just shake your hand and you sort of walk off. And it was almost like, just sort of job done really, to, to be able to thank him in that environment for getting a medal with her as my inspiration. Oh, so it that sounds was, that like was... so perfect and so well deserved, and it's so nice to be recognised. It's amazing, and it's and it's it really is. to shine a light on the on grassroots campaigning about what's yeah. possible with the minimal resources, including intelligence regarding campaigning, but that anyone can do it. Anyone can make a difference. Genuinely, anyone can make a difference. 
Um, you just need some of the tools to help you or positive attitude or care. really it's to care about something enough to want to change it. That's that's the key. Um, but yeah, shine a light on grassroots campaigning. Met the king, gave that. him a Lucy's Law book. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, left it with his assistant and, and got a letter two weeks later saying, you know, his majesty has received your copy of Lucy's. I took, took one for the queen as well. And I got one a letter back from her lady in waiting. So it's, I don't know, there's so many oh, levels of so campaigning going on. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm so happy for you. That's really, thank you. Really well deserved. I'm so happy for you. Thank you so much. This Pleasure. was inspirational, I'm sure. And I'm sure we'll, I'm, I'm hoping we'll keep in touch and, yeah, uh, absolutely. We've got this. So there's more laws that need passing. Maybe after the documentary is out, maybe we'll have another chat. That's going to be out, I think, at the end of summer 2023. So ho hopefully okay. if you've well, got a couple more days filming to do in the UK. Um, but yeah, hopefully it will be on. Well, we're hoping for Netflix. It could be any any platform like that. And um, hopefully that will make a difference. At least it will raise awareness, will. change behavior. Uh, it will. And we'll influence do... legislation. Yeah, we'll get that shared and get that out there and and keep moving forward like we all do. It's it's amazing, Mark. You're an inspiration to so many people. Thank you so much for, for Thank joining you. us. Thank you, Billy, for inviting me on. And yeah, let's chat in a few months' time. Um, and I'll definitely have some more news because there's lots of legislation waiting to pass. And hopefully it will have passed by then and we'll on to be on to some more stuff to help oh, dogs I feel and, positive and all animals. Will. Yeah. Yes. Thanks so much, Mark. Take care. All right. You take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.